Hello, my name is Norman Graham and I'm a minister in the Baptist Union of Churches in Scotland. The aim of these signposts is to try and help to connect the text of the Bible with our everyday lives. I want to read a couple of verses from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28 and verses 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Well, in today's signpost, I want to explore the issue of the presence and absence of God in our lives. It's an issue, I think, that's quite common to people of faith. Uh, the psalmists, for example, often speak of the intimate closeness of God, but then at other times they also express frustration and confusion uh, for those times in which God seems to have left the building. And I'm going to explore that issue looking through the lens of two famous paintings. And the first painting is one that I'm sure that many people will recognise. Most of us will have seen pictures of it and some of us might even have been fortunate enough to be able to travel to Rome and look up at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and, and see it in the flesh, so to speak. It's commonly known as uh, the creation of Adam. And it was painted by Michelangelo, one of the greatest artists of the Renaissance and indeed of all time. And it's certainly a masterpiece amongst the many masterpieces that he created in his lifetime. Interestingly, it might never have existed had it not been for jealousy. The story goes that one of his rivals, another artist called Bramante, was working on the building of St Peter's Basilica and he resented the fact that Michelangelo had been commissioned to design the Pope's tomb. So, in order to scupper Michelangelo's chances, he managed to convince the Pope to have Michelangelo work in a medium with which he was unfamiliar. He was known as a sculptor, not so much as a painter. And so his rival was hoping that he would do a bad job, maybe be sacked, but certainly perhaps not get any other commissions. In some way, just seeking to ruin his reputation. Bramante's jealousy blinded him to Michelangelo's genius because his work on the Sistine Chapel is regarded as one of the great masterpieces of Western art. It took Michelangelo four years of painstaking and quite literally back-breaking work, for in order to paint it, he had to lie on his back on a scaffold with his beard only inches from the ceiling. In his journal, uh, he said that the painting had made him bent tight like a Syrian bow. He was so physically affected by the work that forever afterwards, he couldn't read a letter unless he held it at arm's length above his head. One night, exhausted by the work, alone with his doubts and discouraged that he was going to fail because the project was too big for him, he wrote, I am no painter. Some scholars, though, think that the painting is wrongly titled. And if you look closely at the picture, you can see why. For although it's called the creation of Adam, in fact, in the picture, Adam is already created. He is conscious. His eyes are open and his arm is outstretched. Whatever is going on in the picture, it's not an act of creation. But if it's not an act of creation, then what is it? What was it that Michelangelo was trying to say? I think that the very posture of the two central characters in this painting, God and Adam, hints at something else. Notice first how God is depicted in the scene. In Michelangelo's time, paintings of the creation of Adam always had God standing on the ground, lifting Adam up out of the earth. But Michelangelo takes a different perspective. God is depicted as a white-haired man rushing towards Adam on a cloud, which is symbolic of the chariots of heaven propelled along by angels. The overall sense is one of movement, of power and of an almost desperate urgency. God's body is extended towards the man with great vigour, his body stretching and twisting to get as close as possible to Adam. 
God's head is turned towards Adam and his gaze is firmly fixed on him. With his arm outstretched, every muscle is stretched and straining. As one writer notes, it's as if even in the midst of the splendour of all creation, God's entire being is wrapped up in his impatient desire to close the gap between himself and this man. He can't wait. His hand comes within a hair's breadth of the man's hand. Much has been made of the two outstretched hands and the gap between them. And those who think that this is an act of creation see it as God about to give the divine spark of life to Adam. But as we've already noted, Adam's already conscious and clearly already alive. The figure of Adam, though, is much less intense than that of God. For although his arm is extended towards God, his body is leaning back in a lazy repose. It's almost as if he's not really engaged with or all that interested in making a connection with God. It's as if Adam's sort of thinking, well, you know, if it happens, it happens. I'm not going to, you know, get too stressed out about it. Perhaps we're meant to think that Adam is assuming that if God has come this close, he will draw closer still. Or maybe even Adam's just indifferent. Whatever's going through his mind, all he has to do in order to connect with God is to quite literally just lift a finger. So what is Michelangelo saying here? I think he's trying to show us God's determination to reach out and be with the one that he's created. God is just as close as he can be. But having come that close, he allows just a little space so that Adam can choose. He waits for Adam to make his move. The question is left quite literally hanging in the air. Will Adam lift his finger and connect with God? The issue of how we can connect with God is certainly one of the most important issues we can address. And the good news is that as Michelangelo has depicted and the Bible repeatedly affirms, God's great desire is that we will connect with him, that we will know him in an intimate relationship. And yet, despite God's desire, connecting with God is something that we often find very difficult to do. If I were to ask you what was the most repeated promise in the Bible, I wonder what you would say. It actually, it's a promise that was made to Enoch and to Noah, Abram and Sarah, to Jacob and Joseph, to Moses and Joshua, David, Amos, Mary, Paul and countless others. You see, the central promise of the Bible is not, as many people think, I will forgive you, but rather it is, I will be with you. The promise of God's personal presence is the reason that weak and fearful people have found courage. The fearful Israelites were told, do not be terrified, for the Lord your God will be with you. It's the promise that kept them going in the darkness. As the psalmist affirms, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. When God came to earth in the incarnation we celebrate every Christmas, the name that he was given was Emmanuel. It means God with us. And when Jesus returned to glory, he left us the promise of Matthew 28, 20, I'm with you always. And at the end of time, when the final judgment has fallen and the saints find their rest, they will sing, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. The story that the Bible tells over and over is one of the presentness of God with us. As he was with Adam and Eve in the garden, so he will be with us at the end of all things. And the Bible, of course, also affirms and reaffirms that God is really present right here and now amongst his people. So why is it then that we struggle to experience at times a sense of the presence of God? Why is it that he almost seems to hide himself? 
it, it's a paradox that God assures us that he is present with us, but all too often our experience is more commonly not of his presence, but of his absence and of his hiddenness. And that leads us to another uh, picture by another world-renowned artist whose work you might be familiar with, Martin Hanford, the creator of the Where's Wally books. One of the most successful series of children's books of all times have already sold over 55 million copies and been translated into over 30 languages. They've been turned into games, mobile apps and even a Hollywood movie. It's a franchise that's worth hundreds of millions of pounds, making him one of the most popular and successful artists in history. And the success of the books, of course, has led to all the merchandise that comes with a kind of successful product nowadays. And every year, thousands of fans gather together as the bespeckled hero at conventions where uh, this Where's Wally weekend uh, get togethers. The world record for the greatest number of Wallies in one place was set in Dublin on the 19th of June 2011 when 3,872 people gathered together all dressed as Wally. It's been said that the best ideas are the simplest and they don't come much simpler than Where's Wally? All you have to do is look at the page and find Wally in the crowd. And in theory it should be easy as he wears very distinctive glasses, a red and white striped jumper, a woolly hat and carries a walking stick. It should be easy but actually in practice Wally can be hard to find. In the first pages of the books Wally is quite obvious. Other people are giants so it's easy to see him. But as you go through the book it gets harder and harder. On the final page, he's in a room full of Wallies, almost identical to himself. The only distinction is there's one detail that's different, like a, a missing shoe or something. The author allows rival Wallies to counterfeit his identity. You can be looking at him without even knowing it. It can be quite frustrating. And you can often be left thinking, surely Wally was on this page and I never knew it. Frederick Buchner writes, there is no event so commonplace that God is present within it, always hiddenly, always leaving you room to recognise him or not. Brother Lawrence echoes that thought when he writes, God has various ways of drawing us to him, but sometimes he hides himself. He is there but incognito. Like Wally, sometimes God is hard to find and the question is, why is that? And the answer lies not so much in God's absence, but in ours. Psychologists who study perception refer to a phenomenon called habituation. The basic idea is that when something new enters our environment, we are intensely aware of it. So if you get a new wristwatch, initially you are very aware of it on your wrist. But over time, you gradually notice it less and less. The awareness of it fades over time. In terms of this perception, what is true in the physical realm is also true in the spiritual. Habituation is one of the great challenges of the spiritual life. In some way, it's perhaps more dangerous than outright rebellion against God because although it is just as deadly, it is more subtle and gradual and we don't notice it so easily. When we become habituated to the presence of God in our lives, we begin to sense his presence less. We become less attuned to his voice and his guiding hand. But it's so subtle we don't really notice it happening. Our attention is taken up with other things, newer things that have come into our orbit. The writer to the Hebrews warns us against drifting away from God. And the real problem with drifting is its gradual nature. It's like being on an inflatable at the beach. We don't realise how far out to sea we have drifted uh, until it's too late because it's been slow and gradual. The danger of this habituation is that it lulls us into a false sense of security in our discipleship. We keep doing the things we were doing before, but there's no real connection with God in it. We're going through the motions, but getting nowhere. 
It reminds me of a famous story about Arctic explorers. Uh, William Edward Parry, the English explorer, took a, a crew to the Arctic and they wanted to go further north to continue their, their charting. And so they calculated their location by the stars and started a very difficult and treacherous march north. They walked hour upon hour and finally, totally exhausted, they stopped. Taking their bearings again from the stars, they discovered that they were further south than they had been when they started. It turns out they'd been walking on an ice floe that was moving south faster than they were travelling north. Going through all the right motions, but really getting nowhere. The writer to the Hebrews not only warns us against drifting, but they also provide the remedy against drifting, namely that we must pay closer attention. I think that one of the reasons that God appears to have removed himself is simply so that having uh, become immune to his presence, we will begin actually to sense his absence. And when we sense his absence, that that might stir within us a longing for his presence once more. And so we will begin to seek him afresh. What we need is eyes to see and ears to hear. And just sometimes the persistence to look for God when he seems hidden. In our highly technological, consumer-driven and materialistic culture, there are plenty, just as there are plenty of counterfeit wallies in the books, there are plenty of God alternatives in our world. The truth is that we fail to see the presence of God. We fail to see him at work in us and around us because all too often we're distracted by other things. It's interesting, I don't have any social media on my mobile phone, so um, I don't often look at my phone. And what it's given me the opportunity to do is look at other people. And where everyone is, they're all on their phones, distracted even to the traffic that's around them, even as they're crossing the road, because they're, they're, they're looking at the screen. Distracted, we cannot see God in the present moment in the face of the person in front of us, in the voice of the person speaking to us. Just like Wally in the books, God has written himself into every page in the story of our lives. But we can no longer see him. And yet God is always present and active in our lives, whether we sense his presence or not even though he might act incognito, unknown and unseen, he's still there. And as Michelangelo tried to show us, God is ever straining, reaching for us, longing for us to connect with him. But he won't force the issue. He leaves a gap. He gives us the opportunity to choose, to choose to leave the gap as it is, or to choose to close the gap to reach for him. And the thing is, all we have to do sometimes is nothing more than lifting a finger. Thanks for listening.